Welcome back. I'm playing Wartime City of the Damned, and we have successfully completed the Undead campaign here. Definitely uh, made some mistakes with making my units here, so I thought I'd kind of go through my builds here, see what my give my opinions on things, and hopefully you'll have a little easier time than I did. Uh, this campaign definitely has some aspects that are make this game easier and other ones that make it harder just with the playstyle that I have but your main leader here is the vampire and I think it worked out real well to end up giving him strength now I typically recommend that you stop the strength at 12 and I as you can see I went to 13 so I build them out differently between the two um, because then you can max out your toughness, which will give you some more HP, some more resistances, things like that. Because once you get above 12 strength, there's no longer any benefit to increasing additional inventory slots. Now, the increased strength will increase your melee damage by 3%, but when you're doing like a single-handed, uh, one-handed build, it doesn't really increase your damage by very much. It's like one or two damage, so uh, it doesn't do a huge amount. So really, just getting the increased health is better. Um, I didn't put any points into agility uh, because I wanted him to be a pure tank. Now, ironically, the <clears throat> agility does increase the melee resistance, uh, but that's because when you're doing a high agility build, you'd want to build a dodging unit, and so if those dodgers get hit, they need to have some melee resistance, otherwise they just get killed. Um, so I think getting strength up to 12 and toughness up to 15 is definitely the way to go for your physical points. This will allow you to do a good amount of damage and also be able to survive some hits and get uh, a bunch of healing done because you'll have a good amount of health. You know, he's got over 300. I always like to have my leaders to have 15 leadership. And the reason for that is you can then max, uh, master uh, the war cry ability, which effectively increases the amount of... Um, damage the surrounding units to your leader has and he's allowed to use that ability while he's in combat so if you end up in a big melee where you're all blobbed together you can end up using that ability to boost everybody's damage for one turn and then i do like getting the intelligence up as well uh, the reason for that is because it increases his magic resistance his stun resistance and then you know god forbid that he end up uh, getting any sort of mental condition it also allows him to have some protection against stupidity paranoia derangement and then I just don't find the alertness to be very helpful. Um, the big thing is it protects, helps increase your range resistance, but not a lot of units use range, and when you do, you can usually close the distance with them fast enough to get that range attack shot down. And then with the initiative, it doesn't really make a big difference because he's in heavy armor, has all this stuff, so he's going to go real slow anyways. So it just didn't make a lot of sense. Now, because I'm making him a tank, I did end up going with weapon skill, and I got that maxed out. It will be 15. It says 17 here because I have items equipped that uh, have enchantments that bring it up higher. So if that's confusing, if you're not familiar with why this is happening, this, this number in the parentheses here is what my actual level is, and then it's boosted up a couple of points with the equipment I have on but by doing that it increases uh, his melee resistance so now all of a sudden he does start to get some melee resistance increases his hit chant which is very important for us to be able to land attacks and it increases his parry by four percent so as you can see here I have a hundred and three percent chance to parry and you'd say well why are you getting above a hundred percent chance what's the point of that uh, the reason is is there are certain weapons that can lower parry uh, percentages and there's also abilities that can lower your ability to parry or dodge so by getting it above 100% that'll allow you to still have some high effectiveness and then I like having the accuracy up to 9 as well because that allows me to master some abilities but by doing this you know it allows you to get good um, parrying ability you don't need to really worry about the leadership buffs here for the all alone fear terror checks because these guys are immune to them so you're, I didn't do the leadership because of that in fact if it wasn't for the abilities I wouldn't put any points into leadership and I would go with the alertness and intelligence instead but because I wanted to get the uh, battle cry or whatever it's war cry ability um, ended up putting my maximum points here and then you know it allowed me to end up getting 43% melee resistance and that reduces the chance of your character being hit so when you throw in parry and a good melee resistance that significantly uh, increases his survivability uh, unfortunately he still only has 14 crit resistance with the helmet and this intelligence so um, 
that's not, or sorry, that's stun resistance that's resisted here. Uh, critical hit resistance uh, reduces the chance that he's going to get a critical hit. But when you get critically hit in this game, then you automatically have to do a stun check. And if you don't pass the stun check, then you're stunned. And that'll make you have to waste points, both your offensive, which are your attack points, and your strategic points, which are the points to be able to move and use abilities uh, to get back into combat. And while you're stunned, it's very easy for anybody to hit you. It bypasses all your checks. So uh, for those reasons, you definitely don't want to get stunned. And it is good to stun other uh, units because then you can massively uh, get a kill. And then I did not end up putting any points into ballistics because I just didn't care about him having <clears throat> uh, range weapon. Now you could do see for his backup weapon he has a bow, but that's just in case he couldn't get into combat with somebody or if he somehow got injured enough where I was worried he was going to get killed in melee, I could then position him somewhere so he could still get some shots off with a bow. Um, but it wasn't really relevant. So in terms of the builds here that I did, uh, I got Web of, Skill, uh, Web of Steel Mastery, and what that effectively does is normally you can only parry once when you uh, end up upgrading and getting trained in web of steel for the basic then it allows you to parry twice and if you master it it now allows three parries per turn and when you parry it allows you <clears throat> to reduce the cost of an offense uh, to a counter attack by one and then if you end up uh, giving him swift counter then when you do counter attack you get an 80 percent chance to regain that offensive point so then if you parry again you can get another attack so you can potentially get up to three extra attacks assuming you have one offensive point uh, saved up at the end of your turn which you should if you have a one-handed weapon because each one-handed weapon attack is two offensive points so that'll give you four attacks that you can do one left over and then potentially a three additional attacks if you're pairing and regaining those points likewise because i wanted him to be a tank i ended up giving him the armor proficiency and that requires your strength to be to 12 if i remember correctly and that allows you to minimize the movement penalties to heavy armor and it also increases your armor absorption by an additional 5% so that gives you some protection and then the leadership like we talked about uh, being maxed out to 15 was so I could get the war cry maxed out and that allows you to increase um, melee damage to your allies by 20% it has no effect on the character that's using it and I wanted to get the accuracy up because I like getting quick incision mastered and what that effectively does is every time you strike somebody you lower their melee resistance by 6% and this is stackable. So that makes this one of the best abilities in the game because you, you know if you hit all four times that's 24% melee resistance that you just lowered them and then if you have that on everybody else you should effectively, being, you should effectively be able to nullify uh, the melee resistance. And now I did master the swift counter but I think it would have made more sense to master the shield specialist since I wanted to do a full tank build here and what that allowed me that would have allowed me to do is increase his melee resistance and parry chance by an additional five percent um, so that would increase his survivability even further and I think the baseline is like a 40 percent so it's up to you whether you want to try to guarantee uh, more recovery of offensive points to do more counter attacks if you're pairing successfully or to increase his chances surviving and pairing even further so um, I think either would be fine um, but for the most part if there's some weapons and attacks that can't be parried in this game that's the one bad thing about parry unlike dodge everything can be dodged in this game but not everything can be parried uh, so that's the one downside so by increasing his survivability and tanking ability which is what melee resistance allows you to do that may be a better choice but overall this is a pretty decent build i was not uh disappointed with that at all um, and he worked out pretty well and then he also has the terror ability that was not something i had to learn it's just his starting ability and what it effectively does is if the opponents fail their check then they lose three offensive and strategy points uh, so it's definitely an incredible ability so if you're fighting guys that have poor morale then this guy can not only get in there take a bunch of hits do decent damage but he can also significantly weaken the enemy forces that have to pass those terror checks so for that reason your leader is definitely MVP on most of your matches here and I definitely like the way this guy was built out this was my other one, pretty much the same, except as you can see here, this was my backup guy. So uh, I only put the 12 strength into him to max out the toughness. And then uh, for him, I did give him the uh, shield specialist and the quick incision. Now his parry is a little bit lower because of the uh, 
Actually, I'm not quite sure why his parry is a little bit lower, but it is. Um, but th he ended up getting up to melee resistance of 60%, so that's higher here. And I was definitely pretty happy with both of these guys' builds. Like I said, either one would be fine for you. Uh, it just depends on whether you want to maximize the amount of counterattacks or the survivability. In terms of my main healing unit, the Poison Globadier becomes a must-take. Uh, I don't think I think any game where you have access to the Globinier you have to take him because he's by far the most powerful healer in the game. I still think giving him a ranged build is the best way to go because enemy units definitely love to just swarm this guy and take him out as fast as possible and he is quite squishy, especially when you have him in his ranged stance because you may not have dodge or sidestep activated, um, but definitely you need to bring him along. Uh, I did like bringing his strength up to 6 so that way he had extra inventory slots and then uh, I did that after we maximized his agility to get his dodge and melee resistance as high as possible and then with the residual points I put him into toughness. Now I brought up his leadership all the way just to ensure that he would pass his psychological test because there's nothing worse than getting uh, two guys t um, ganging up on your poison globadier. He freaks out, pa uh, fails his all alone check and then gets multiple attacks while he's trying to run because he cannot take many hits even though you're thinking oh god he's got 280 health your tank only had 320 so that's only 40 health difference with that lower melee uh resistances the low uh armor absorption all those things make this guy easily get killed in uh, melee and then i just put the rest of the points into intelligence to try to buff up his stun resistance because again if he gets stunned he's gonna die and then in terms of the martial abilities, I maxed out his ballistic skill to increase his melee or his ranged damage and his uh, chance to hit. And I put everything else into accuracy to try to increase his uh, crit chances with uh, his ranged unit or his ranged attacks here. Unfortunately, because you're using the pistols here, which I definitely like because it causes debuffs to the enemies that you hit with it. Uh, it does have a tiring effect with the gun, so you have to so it goes up by one offensive point. So you, until you get to a level 10, you can only do two attacks. So if you wanted to give him like the shurikens or something like that, it may actually make more sense. He may actually be able to do more damage. But uh, I like to give him the warp stone, uh, warp, warp lock pistols, I should say. And then in terms of his abilities, he comes out with the poison globes at baseline. So didn't really do anything there. Didn't spend points. The infused globes are what allow you to do the healing. And you definitely want to master that because you can use it up to three times by the time he gets to three times a turn by the time you get him up to level 10. So that's 90 HP that you can heal on your units. Now just be aware that it does, in, in exchange for that, it does inflict a random debuff on one of your units. So especially for like the ghouls that have two-handed weapons that have tiring, if they lose one of their offensive points, that effectively means they're going to lose one of their attacks and they can only do maximum of two so then that's only one attack per turn so this guy did really weaken up the uh, ghouls but with their other you know with all the healing it allowed it to still work out okay so I still think it makes sense for that but just remember that you get the debuff so if you are throwing it and you're like you're fighting enemies that aren't actually injured so you're not worried about healing them then you can just hit them with the globe and it'll just give them a debuff as well um, so that works out pretty well I did like giving this guy sidestep. Now I rarely used it, but if he did get caught into melee and I couldn't escape, then I'd switch him into his melee weapons and then the sidestep would give him the potential to do two dodges uh, per turn. And there was definitely some times where that saved his life on the campaign. So I still recommend that you get the sidestep. And then the ability I played around with this time that I actually think I'll use in the future is this warp fumes. Now, again, going along with if he ends up getting caught into melee, you'll switch him over, you'll have the sidestep. He already has 80 dodge with his maxed out agility, but then you can use warp fumes and it'll increase your melee hit chance by 10% because it's already kind of low. As you can see, he's only got four weapon skill because I put everything into ballistics. And it also uh, increases his dodge chance by an additional 10%. Now, it does reduce his... Uh, 
range hit chance and range resistance, but rarely are you going to be in a situation where they're going to be getting this guy into melee and shooting him from range, and you don't care about reducing your range hit chance if you're locked into melee, or melee combat and not range, so uh, I think that actually works out pretty well. And then for must-have abilities for range units, is you want to get the quick reload, because it allows you to bypass a lot of the cost for reloading your weapons to allow you to get um, the maximum of three attacks and then by also mastering bullseye that allow you to aim for every shot and once you start to get this guy leveled up like this then it's effectively you're getting 80 90 percent hits pretty regularly so you should be uh, able to hit most guys because once they're into melee it reduces your hit chance so this allows you to kind of mitigate that significantly I did like Trick Shooter because it allows you to bypass 10% of the range resistance, which by default means you're going to be having an increased chance of hitting. And then Eagle Eyes was the last thing, and that allows you to just bypass 5% of the armor, and that just increases the amount of damage he does by 5%. So um, that was fairly reasonable. I think the alternative is you could probably give him Sharpshooter, especially if you were focusing more on your accuracy over your hit chances, which could make sense, uh, especially if you're going to do these other abilities that are going to allow you to increase your chance to hit. And then that allows you to uh, increase your critical chance by four percent after you do damage and so if you're having three to four attacks depending on what range weapon you're using uh, that could be a significant hit chance because he's already at 18 percent you know if you put in another five that would be another five so that would be 23 percent and then a stackable uh, four increase would be very powerful especially if you ended up giving him uh, weapon traits that increases critical hit chance even higher you're going to be pushing yourself into the mid to upper 30s for your critical hit chance and then if you're doing three to four attacks per turn statistically one of those should be a crit and that would significantly allow this guy to buff up everybody else so uh, just keep that in mind i just like going for the guaranteed hits more but if you were going to do a crit build on these guys it's definitely viable especially at range. And then you could also turn him into a crazy critter in uh, melee as well if you wanted to do that um, because he has access to the swarm ability. But you're unlikely to be able to use that unless you hire henchmen that are going to be Skaven. And then he also has a dagger specialist which increases your chance to hit even further and they allow you to bypass dodge. So he can be a decent melee brawler here but with how squishy he is, I would much rather just keep him to range. So I was very happy with his build that way, and I would definitely play around with it again. Um, the next unit we had was the Doom Weaver. I really like this guy. Um, he wasn't totally maxed out. I just didn't level him up enough. I think he would have been very good if I would have gotten him to 10. He would have been one of my favorite units, actually. Uh, so maybe when we get to the... Uh, Chaos forces will get access to a Doom Weaver again. Maybe I could try to melee or er, level him up all the way. But I got him up to 12 strength that way because this guy can use heavy armor and he can actually be a decent tank for you with all of his other passive abilities. So I liked giving him the 12 strength. I brought him up to 11 uh, toughness. I'm sure I would have maxed that out to uh, 12 had I mastered him. Uh, I wanted to get his intelligence up because he does actually have some very powerful spell abilities. And I wasn't sure because if he would have got injured and lost some strength, then I wouldn't have been able to make him a tank. So I wanted to get the intelligence up in case that plan failed and I had to transition him to be a pure spellcaster. And then I wanted to get the leadership up because he's got pretty bad leadership. So you he'll fail his fear and terror checks pretty regularly. Um, so that was one major downside with him. But overall, like I said, I was very happy with him. He has the ability to get up to 15 weapon skill, which means you can master Web of Steel. And then I put everything else into accuracy. Now, I don't know if I would have got his accuracy high enough to allow me to master uh, Quick Incision, unfortunately. But uh, overall, uh, overall, I was very happy with this guy because with his passive abilities, uh, there was other things that could be utilized instead of the... Um, quick incision. So, like I said, I ended up mastering Web of Steel. Uh, I wanted to master Ritual of Scorn if I had enough abilities. So what this effectively does is allow you to buff everybody around you that's your own, your allies, I should say, not the um, enemies. And what it does is increases their critical hit chance by 10%. And their Let's see, increases critical hit chance by that. Yeah, okay. But it only reduces the critical 
resistance of him being the spellcaster, not everybody around there. I thought for a second there when I read that at the bottom for the mastery that I was going to start applying that to everybody. I was going to say, oh my god, this ability sucks. But no, so that still worked out because I had some guys built out as critters and uh, this would significantly buff their ability by 10%. So this would have been an amazing ability for if you were doing a crit build, which you definitely could do with uh, the undead. And then his baseline um, ability is favored. So what it effectively does is when he triggers Inch's Kurtz, which is why I don't care if he has all this uh, equipment on, is it only does AOE ones. So you just got to be careful he's not next to all of your guys because then you could end up adding negative traits to them. But uh, it can also add a bunch of negative traits and damage to enemies that may be surrounding him. And because it's always at the AoE ones, it won't be the one-shot kill that sometimes happens with your spellcaster. So it just feels bad when that happens. Um, but his passive ability that you, or his other ability you can level up is this uh, obscurity. And that increases his melee and range resistance by 10%, making it one of the best uh, tanking abilities in the game. As we discussed, I gave him the armor proficiency. Uh, and that's the same way it works with every other character. I would have liked to get him Shield Specialist to get it raised even higher because that would have brought him up to 77 um, melee resistance potentially. Or actually, I guess it would be an additional 5%. So that would be, what, 72%. And then his parry would go up to um, 98%. And he even had other abilities in addition to that to use. I mean, if you were going to do the da if you wanted to use him as a spell caster, then you'd give him this ability here to increase his spell damage by 20%. If you wanted to just have him spam debuffs, well, and be like a total schizo while he's running around casting spells, then you could give him this to just have him keep nuking himself. Uh, all that stuff is good. Chaotic advantage is if you were going to end up wanting him to. Uh, be a major tank and if you wanted to have him be able to keep countering then you can get him chaotic advantage <clears throat> therefore every time he successfully parried something he'd have a 40 percent chance to uh recover an offensive point to allow him to attack multiple times uh so effectively very very similar to um what is that ability swift counter except this version it's effectively a cheaper swift counter uh, because this requires 15 weapon skill to get to that mastery, whereas this one only requires uh, 9 to end up getting there. And then the big advantage of this one is it allows you to use it with dodging as well. So if you had like a one-handed dodge build going on, then you could potentially do some uh, counterattacks with that as well. Um, so definitely uh, a lot of utility for this guy. And he also has like this blood offering, which is not a bad ability. You can increase your damage by 50% and your critical hit chance by an additional 10% for uh, one extra cost. So again, if you wanted to put points in this guy and make him a critter, he could definitely have a crit build with everything else going on here. So definitely just tons of utility for him. And then for his spells, I never really used the Boon of Ruin. I just didn't really like it very much. Um, but again, it allows you to just put guys up into countering. But and the by the bad side of it is every time they do successfully attack, uh, they'll inflict damage to themselves. So that's the downside to it. So I don't really like that. Um, so I didn't use it. But there is some utility there. But the ability I really like is the Idol of Blood. And what that effectively does is creates an AOE area. If you played this game, you know how the idols work. You plop it down on the ground and then in a 10 meter radius around there, any allies that are in that location will end up getting the uh, buff here. And that allows it for every attack that they successfully complete, they heal 10 damage. And so if you're having a one-handed build that has four attacks, that's 40 health that you're healing every turn with this ability. And I think it sticks around for two turns, yeah. And you can cast only one of these per turn, but every turn you can effectively plop it around the battlefield, allowing you to set up these zones of healing. Um, but again, with all this other equipment, his success chance for being able to deploy the spells a little bit lower but it definitely allows more healing so if you have that going and your 90 heal from your globadier it makes your guys damn near impossible to kill and the good thing about these guys is they can be healed by the poison globadier whereas the, po and the poison globadier could technically be healed by these guys if uh the globadier had a melee weapon on and then 
I don't really think I would ever use that ability, nor this, unless you were going to be using a lot of spell casting. Then I guess the idle change would help you because it reduces the offensive points of your spell casting. Um, the lust increases stun and crit resistance, but I was like, eh, it's not very impressive and it lowers morale. So I guess potentially you could end up breaking guys a little bit easier, but. I'm not a big fan. The Idol of Pestilence definitely could be good because it lowers stats of your opponents and therefore it's going to make them easier to hit, make them do less damage to you, uh, reduce their uh, resistances. So for all those reasons, Idol of Pestilence would be a good ability as well. And then the Burning uh, Blood, if you were to end up stacking this multiple times onto a unit, you could do significant amounts of damage, uh, especially against boss units and things. So I think that's where that ability would really shine. And then the other ability that would be real good is the Spiteful Manifestation. So if you didn't want to have to cast multiple spells here to get it to stack up to do lots of damage, increasing your chance of doing Zinch Curse, you could end up just mastering the Spiteful manifestation which does a tiny bit of damage uh, but it decreases armor absorption by 20% uh, once it's mastered and it if now the one bad thing is it affects everybody around him so you have to be real careful about uh, hitting your own guys but uh, it's definitely something that you could be uh, using if he got surrounded by a bunch of units which occasionally does happen they do seem to think he's a weaker unit than what he actually is when you build him out as a tank I don't know if it's coded to think oh it's a spellcaster he's gonna be squishy but uh, since it is an AoE uh, you could put that on everybody around him and then send your guys in there to uh, counter attack him but I think I think I'd much rather go with the idols myself, but there's definitely lots of things that you could do with him, so he's definitely a fun unit. Now, the Cryptor here, I did a little bit of a different build with this guy. I wanted to max out his strength, so he's got 22 strength right now, uh, 20 with the baseline abilities. I maxed out, that's with his agility being maxed out, and so he has got 130% chance to dodge, and then with the rest of the points, I was putting it into toughness. Uh, he reluctantly got a bunch of leadership, uh, which was, I guess, unnecessary, um, but he got the intelligence for the stun resistance and the maxed out alertness so he could get the melee resistance uh, abilities uh, which I'll go through next and then for his weapon skills I did focus on getting his accuracy up as fast as possible or as high as possible because I wanted to try to do a crit build for him and I think it is highly effective and uh, therefore his weapon skills a little bit lower now unfortunately there were times where he was missing attacks because this was so low so I think you have to decide what you want. Do you want to focus on pure damage or do you want to focus on critting? And I wanted to try a crit build here, but if you wanted to do a fear, uh, pure damage build and have your hits count, then you'd want to do more weapon skill and less accuracy. But for his abilities, he has the terror at by default, which is the same as the vampire here. I gave him the quick incision mastery, which, you know, I'm just a big fan of that ability because it increases the chance of successful hits. I gave him the awareness, which gives him plus 10% melee resistance. So he's only got 46, but he also has the light armor on. Now I did give him deep wounds, which increases the critical hit damage by 20%. And then I also gave him fatality, which every after he hits somebody, he increases his critical hit chance by 10%. So that brings that up to 31. He does have sidestep mastery, so he gets three dodges per turn. He's got insult learned, which lowers melee resistance by an additional 10%, which allows, uh, again, increased chance of hitting. And then I gave him vital strike. Uh, I do think that was reasonable, but the problem that I got really frustrated with on this game is sometimes it would cause the vital strike to be the first attack. And after I played a whole campaign where I'm used to his regular attack being the first thing up there, I'd sometimes click too quick. And my first hit would be with vital strike, and that is not how you want to do this, especially with this build. Uh, the reason is, is you want to do a regular attack so you can trigger fatality if it hits and then that will allow you to then switch over to vital strike which will then mean that you have a 50 50 chance of critting which usually means you're going to crit and if you did not crit then you could do a second 
uh, vital strike and hit him again and if it did work then you would switch back to your regular attacks to save up your offensive points and then just be able to start smacking the stunned unit very easily but that allowed him to really stun a lot of units and allow us to get a lot of easy kills so I was pretty happy with this build here um, and you could if you wanted to increase damage further you could not learn that ability and instead could give him like into the breach which allows you to bypass armor absorption uh, won't let me show the ability unfortunately because of everything that's going on here uh, with the passive ability since they're full but um, that would have been an alternative build I suppose instead of doing quick incision so that way you could do uh, the insult and have everybody else quick incision but again this guy tends to go pretty quickly with all of his alertness being here because uh, he has high as an initiative so I like this build I would definitely recommend playing around with this just got to be careful with the regular attack versus the vital strike being the first attack now the ghouls, they are good units, um, but they're very squishy, even though they have 295 health. So what I ended up doing with these guys is obviously maxing out their agility. I brought them up to 9 strength, so that way they had a decent amount of carrying capacity, because every 3 strength you have, it increases your carrying capacity by 1, up to 12 uh, strength that it maxes out your inventory, but I needed to have more points into toughness, because these guys were getting damaged pretty regularly. I had trouble keeping these guys alive, um, but I ended up maxing out their intelligence to be able to increase their stun resistance and then I gave them alertness which increased their initiative and their range resistance. I didn't put any points into leadership because they don't have to worry about the all alone and fear test. The bad thing about that is I like giving these my henchmen insult ability usually that way at least somebody's there lowering melee resistance but because I didn't have any points into leadership I was unable to give them that ability. Um, I did end up focusing on their chances to hit because they were I would the way I'd build these guys out would kind of vary depending on the um, what point in the game they were and what point into the leveling they were because they start out with three offensive points. So when that's the case, if you're not going to use a shield, which these guys can't, they just don't have the ability to do it. You likely want to give them a two-handed weapon be, or or two one-handed weapons to increase their damage because they're only going to have one attack no matter what. And then once they got up to four offensive points, I would put them into a single one-handed weapon. That way they get two attacks since they would still be missing attacks fairly regularly at that point in time. And then they'd stay with the one-handed weapon until they got to a point where they leveled to get the five offensive points. And then again, I'd have to decide, am I going to give him uh, a really good two-handed weapon so he gets the two attacks with the tiring because it'll do two offensive points for the first attack and then three for the second attack attack or two one-handed weapons towards the end of the game when you're getting two purple one-handed weapons you'll want to do the one-handed weapons because then especially if you get enchantments on there you're doubling the amount of enchantments you get and most things all stack on each other um, so that works out quite well for these guys and actually allows them to do good damage here as you can see they do 61 to 73 damage um, but the weapon skill therefore was why I was focusing on that because I needed them to hit their attacks when they would do that by maxing out their agility they usually get up to 115 dodge and these are their resistances here so uh, the big thing with them is you do build them out as dodgers and because they are Henchmen, they can't get masteries, so I ended up getting them sidestep, death stench, which allows you to reduce melee resistance, parry, and dodge by 5%. You just got to be careful that you don't have your units that are not resist, are not immune to this, like your Doom Weaver, your uh, Globadier. Those guys could actually be debuffed by this ability, so you just got to be careful with that. And I ended up giving them Ignore Pain just because I couldn't give them the insult. I definitely would prefer the insult, but I just didn't have the leadership there. So maybe if I did this again, I'd have less points into uh, Alertness and put some into leadership because then uh, that would allow them to increase their ability to hit guys. But my thought with the toughness is they have light armor, so using this ability, doing 20 damage to them, uh, increasing their damage resist by 10%, and then running in there with the Globadier to heal that damage up uh, would allow you to spam it but what I found is because these guys were usually also running around the map collecting warp stone and other things I never had my Globadier near them so I wasn't super happy with the build so I think again if I were to do this again I would take some of these points from alertness put them into leadership and get insult because by the end of the game there you can usually use the insult and dodge um, and, and then you can have the other guys all sidestep. So there's ways to do this for sure. And now their 
passive ability that you get by that they just start with is actually pretty good it's disease carrier and it allows you to apply a random debuff so the five initiative it's like who cares but the critical hit resistance is good because if you can end up uh, throwing on multiple multiple of those then you can end up critting pretty decently or you can reduce their dodge or parry chances and then this is stackable and it also lasts for three turns so that really allows you to use these guys to really set up all your critters to do some crazy crit damage. Um, so that's one of the reasons why uh, you may want to do a crit build with your undead. Because uh, it's an incredibly easy thing to set up with all these abilities. And uh, it's very viable. And in fact you could set these guys up to be crit guys too. But again I wanted them to be the pure damage dealers and to increase their chance to hit to be able to stack up as many of these disease carriers as you could. Now for their other passives, I gave them Find the Breach, which is a unique undead ability and effectively allows you to bypass 5% of armor absorption, 10% if you maximize it. Uh, quick Incision, again, to be able to increase the chances of all my guys hitting. I gave them the awareness to reduce the, or to increase the melee resistance by an additional 5%, and then Avoid, which brought up their dodge chances even further. I did have one of these guys have uh, Hardy as well. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of it. It literally just added, like it said, 20 HP. I thought maybe with it being base wounds that it would add 20 and then it would add modifiers to the HP. And maybe it did because it added like 2 HP to it. Um, but it just didn't come out to be a significant increase in the amount of HP. So I think just getting the dodge higher is a better way to go. Because I guess it's better to not be hit than it is to tank things in this game. Um, the Necromancer, I had I had trouble leveling him. I always have trouble leveling my spellcasters, it seems. I, it just seems like I can't get them to get their kills easily. But I set him up as a range build. He actually did pretty decent as a range build. Uh, he also has a significant amount of intelligence. So what I would have liked to do is set him up as a ranged spellcaster and just spammed abilities. Um, but I just never got him leveled up far enough to be able to get all the spell points. But how I ended up building him out was focusing on agility and then getting him toughness to be able to get his HP up higher. And I was going to neglect the strength because it was more important to me to keep this guy alive because he would frequently get charged and units would try to kill him here. Um, I was getting him the intelligence maxed up for his damage because, you know, 20 times 3 is like a 60% damage increase. And the leadership to, re to have to pass all of his morale checks because this guy um, is not immune to uh, terror, fear, or all alone like the ghouls and the zombie and the vampire thralls the vampire are um, but he does have the death stench immunity so you don't have to worry about him getting affected by that um, so i ended up giving him ballistic skill to 15 so i could give him some of those really good passive ranged abilities and then focusing on the accuracy to bring up his uh crit chance so in terms of his abilities, I gave him the sidestep. He can't master it because his uh, agility doesn't go high enough. But if he got into melee, this would allow him to have two dodge attempts at 80%, which isn't unreasonable. Um, if you end up give, collecting Wardstone with him, it decreases the cost of your next spell by one offensive point. But it has to be the next action. Um, so that allows you to potentially get an extra spell cast in there. Uh, I did like giving him the uh, quick reload and the bullseye maxed, uh, that mastered I should say. That way he could do lots of ranged attacks. And he actually has quite powerful um, spells. So uh, I did end up mastering Rotten Touch because with all those disease carrying abilities, in addition to his buff to damage and the ghouls throwing on the disease carrier, it increases the amount of damage that's done to these units. Uh, so if you had somebody that says like six charges of the disease carrier, there's bonus damage that occurs because of that 
with this ability on top of the 16 to 26 damage that it does already and then it adds that amplify amplifies the damage additionally with the uh, spell the intelligence here so I wish what this game would do is like put in parentheses what it's actually gonna do with your modifiers applied because it makes it look like the spells that do very little damage but this actually does pretty well and it allows you to bypass armor so if you have a real tanky boy that you're having trouble killing these spells work out very well now he also has the ability to use heart failure <clears throat> which is actually a very good ability. Um, what it does is uh, every time that they end up attacking, they have a 50% chance of losing two offensive or uh, strategic and strategic points, and you bring that up to 50% once you master it. So that allows you to really uh, kind of mess with the enemy units attacking you, especially if they have two-handed weapons. And then he has other abilities. If you're going to do a zombie build, this is a must-have. Uh, it can also be used to buff up your other units as well. Um, pretty much it increases the dodge and initiative for the vampire, vampire thralls, ghouls, and cryptors. But if you put it on the zombies, it increases their movement and armor absorption. And that allows them to actually start becoming quite good tanks. But without it, the zombies freaking suck. But I don't like having this guy sitting back and having to just waste his turn buffing everybody. Especially because the ability only lasts for two turns. Where I wish if it lasted three turns, like a lot of the other masteries, I think it would be a better build. But because it's only two turns, I was just annoyed by that ability. Um, <clears throat> the corpse flesh is not a bad ability, but it only maxes out your armor absorption at 5%. Oh, that's not true. It goes up to 10% on the mastery, but that wasn't huge, so I bypassed that. If you are fighting low-tier units that we're going to have trouble passing morale or fear, terror, all loan checks, and you could throw this down because uh, that would increase their chance of uh, failing it and their morale checks, but again, I just didn't find that to be very useful, but that could potentially allow you to stack up additional debuffs on your units. Um, Life Stealer actually was quite a good ability. At first I was really kind of down on it, but once I saw how powerful it was becoming in Katarina's, who's the um, VIP on this campaign that helps you on story missions, she was regularly doing, you know, 40 damage and healing uh, for 16, so I assume this guy would be doing around that amount of damage too. And then he'd be able to have a self-heal to keep himself alive. So I think going with the Life Stealer would definitely work out well. Uh, the Warp Overcharge, I just never found that to be an ability that I was really very worried about. You know, yeah, it does decent damage, but you have to wait a turn for it to go off. Excuse me. So for that reason, you know, I'd rather just kill guys on the turn I'm on instead of having to waiting a turn to do it. So I, I was never a big fan of that. And then the uh, Spell of Doom would be the other ability that I would really like. And the reason for that is that it's an AoE attack that only affects enemies. And so if you, you know, you're doing 14 to 24 plus 60% damage of that, plus, you know, a little bit reduced cost if you end up gathering some warp stone, uh, you could do decent damage with this guy. So he definitely has great abilities and you just have to decide which way you want to build them. So definitely uh, would have been a fun unit to have maxed out, but I never quite got there. Now, the Vampire Thrall, she was also a very good unit. I uh, brought her up to 12 strength. That allowed her to maximize uh, her armor potentials and then put a bunch of points into toughness to get her uh, to be able to tank a little bit better. Uh, maxed out her leadership, again, to be able to... Uh, be able to have some spell magic resistance and stun resistance and ended up putting the rest of the points into alertness. Now this is a bad example because she's actually not max leveled so let's bring up the one that I did max level here. Um, so ended up putting nothing into the leadership for the reasons we just discussed however I think you could make an argument that I could have given her the insult ability but I'd rather go with mastering ability so I like the way I built her instead and then gave her a little more alertness which helped give her a little more initiative always focus on 15 weapon skill if you're gonna do a parry build which is what she tanks usually are and that allows her to get the web of steel mastered and then she can get to nine accuracy to allow you to 
master uh, quick incision. So for her abilities, again, because I'm doing a tank parry build, it was web of steel. She has fear. So what that does is reduces the chance to hit by 30%. If you fail your fear check, quick incision to lower the melee resistance. Again, the armor proficiency mastered, the shield specialist mastered, and the swift counter mastered. So that way she could be able to do multiple counter attacks with the same reasoning that we had with our leader here. Um, so this allows her to be quite powerful she gets up to 45 melee um, just a good overall unit you definitely could increase her damage further and make her a dodge unit because at 15 agility, uh, agility you could do like a dodge crit damage dealer build with a two-handed weapon but again with two-handed weapons I'm not a huge fan of those on the leaders because until they get to their max level you're only doing two attacks instead of three to four so rather give them one-handed weapons myself We also, for uh, one of our leaders, or heroes I guess they're called, is the Dreg. Now this would be an alternative unit. He can be built out several different ways. Again, I like making these guys tanks because then my ghouls could run in there, do a bunch of damage, and kind of mop things up. And these guys could hold the front line. And if we were doing like a warpstone rush, which you guys know I always try to do, um, he can pick up a bunch of items. So I gave him uh, 14 strength. Uh, he maxed out his toughness, so pretty much what I did is I got him up to 12, got him his armor mastery, and then put everything else into toughness. Uh, he did need the leadership because he is not immune to anything other than the death stench. Um, so he needed to have that morale up. Now, unfortunately, because he only has six leadership, he will fail pretty much most of his psychological tests. So that's definitely a big bummer. Um, his intelligence was maxed out to nine, and the rest of the points are going into the alertness. Uh, I did max out his weapon skill because I wanted him to just be able to hit as much as possible, and then I put points to get up to nine accuracy to be able to master quick incision. Uh, alternatively, if you wanted to make him to be one of your ranged units, he can definitely fill that uh, need because the henchmen for the undead cannot use ranged weapons. So if you are a big fan of ranged damage, this guy could be an excellent uh, ranged hero as well. But I just wanted him to be in the thick of it, be able to tank, especially early on because the ghouls were getting injured way more than most of my other henchmen because they just had to use light armor and because everybody is using the light armor for the henchmen i just didn't have enough higher tier armors to put on everybody so they just were staying in common equipment and that was causing them to suffer a bunch of injuries so for his build uh, he starts out with this ability i didn't select it but a humble servant effectively allows him to sacrifice 25 uh, hit points for himself to heal up one of your vampires by 15% and then it also increases the initiative and dodge of the vampires for two turns so I don't know I guess it could be helpful if somebody was about to die um, but for the most part I don't think I used it a single time I did give him the web of steel mastery again because he was a parry tank build uh, armor for the same reason shield specialist quick incision and then I gave him the swift counter uh, did the same kind of tank one-handed shield counter build. I really like that build as you can tell and these guys can definitely fill that role. Unfortunately he did not get much for skill points so I could not put further things into his passive or active skills so I was a little disappointed that his uh, skill mastery was so much lower than the rest of the uh, abilities so definitely in the long run using the vampire thrall was a much better way to go uh, for a melee hero. So once the thralls were getting leveled up this guy kind of fell out of favor but early on this guy definitely was filling a big need and then I suppose late game if you weren't using the necromancer or didn't have the necromancer set up as a range build or the globadier and you wanted a ranged hero again that would be the niche this guy would fill but the vampire thralls in the long term were a better use because they could do the fear ability and everything else that he could do too so and then finally my least favorite unit is the zombies I tried to level them up several times they just kept getting killed especially because I did not uh, use the necromancers to buff these guys up and so without those buffs these guys are damn near worthless so I was not a big fan of the zombies and just went with a ghoul build effectively but got him up to 12 strength that way you could get the maximum amount of carrying capacity because effectively this guy just meandered around the map collecting items while everybody else did all the work and then tried to get his toughness as high as possible
possible. If you were to want to do a zombie army, definitely you'd want to do a build like this, and then you'd have your necromancer put the buffs on them because then that give you additional armor um, absorption, and then with all their toughness going here, um, they definitely can be a very powerful force, and they can actually have decent movement once they start to uh, get the buffs on there, but you effectively just have to have the necromancer back there, and you just got to keep spamming that ability every two turns, and that's just too much uh, micromanaging for me. I'm too impatient for that shit. But their leadership is abysmal, but it doesn't have to, it doesn't matter because they're unwavering, so they don't have to pass any checks. Uh, I maxed out their intelligence, which was ironic that I have this brain dead zombie with 12 intelligence, which is higher than most of my other units, uh, just to get them the stun resistance, and then everything else was going into the alertness. Uh, did max out his weapon skill to 16 to increase his chance to hit and increase his parry chance, and then everything else was going into uh, accuracy. Obviously, these guys, even though they have some ballistic skill, they can't use ballistic weapons, so there's no reason to do it. And then the other downside to the zombies is they have multiple passive uh, ability blocks here, so that really limits their potential. But uh, they have the puppet here, which effectively just means they're going to receive four less skill points than the other henchmen, uh, which is a big bummer, so you're already at a loss there. Um, they do have Rotten Corpse, which is probably good, but uh, the issue is is that they're immune to, well, it's not really an issue, it's actually good that they're immune to the open wound effects, because that's a debuff that applies to your units, uh, but they do have um, resistance, so they don't even have to roll for some injuries, pretty much they every time they get injured, you either roll for getting destroyed, which means they die, a severed arm, a severed leg, a hand injury, or they make a full recovery, so, and then, uh, you must roll for injuries at the end of combat. There's a 20% chance to decay and effectively be destroyed. But for every rank you go up, it reduces the chance of rolling that by 9%. So effectively, or 10%, I guess, if at level 10. But like I said, I'm not a huge fan of zombies. I think going with ghouls is a much better way to go, especially if you're doing like a crit build. Um, just much better, but like I said, these guys can be good if you're going to waste your time with the Necromancer buffing everybody. It's not really a waste of time, it actually probably make a more effective army, but it was just way too much for me to want to deal with. Um, so I ended up giving these guys Flash Parry to increase his parry chance further, Quick Incision, and then Shield Specialist, because I was having trouble keeping this guy alive, and I wanted to try to get him up to level 10 to just see what the maximum things that he could do were, but didn't quite make it, because like I said, I think I tried three or four zombies, and all three of them other than that guy ended up getting killed so I was definitely getting down on these guys um, again if you're doing a crit build I think you definitely want to either give abilities that like the misfortune to reduce critical hit resistance because that stacks and you can also do the carnage to increase critical hit damage because you already have the 20% plus 40 for this and you could do 60 if you gave the second weapon that or if you had these havoc ones that gives you plus 4% chance to crit and that's just with the blue I don't think I have any that are Havocs at purple, so I imagine it'd probably be 6%, but you could get a, potentially an additional 12% if you had two Havoc um, ruins on your weapon here. So you could, like I said, really do some crazy crit damages uh, and hit ch uh, crit chances with the undead uh, much higher than you can probably with most other factions With if you're doing a ghoul build and you just happen to get those uh, disease uh, critical hit resistance uh, debuffs on your unit. So... That's uh, how I built out our undead guys here. Like I said, it made for a pretty easy campaign, uh, especially once you have a Globadier in here to be able to heal everybody. It was very frustrating in the start of it because of difficulty getting these guys all equipped with good shirts, uh, cloth armors, I guess I should call them. And uh, I still actually had trouble getting really good armors for the most of this campaign, unfortunately. And I was a little bit slow to get the uh, Cryptor started as well, which kind of carried out the length of this campaign a little bit longer than it had to be. Uh, but that was my mistake. But I think if you build these guys out similar to what I had here, kind of do things a little bit differently like I recommend, I think you'll have a real easy time beating the Undead campaign. So... Thanks for watching. I hope you're enjoying these videos. Oh, and then the only other thing I'd mention for you is for the smugglers here, uh, I always recommend that you try to decide which things you want to level first. Unfortunately, I found that this faction has kind of the shittiest order uh, for reduced spells out of all the factions that I play. Well, 
the ones I've done so far. I mean, I've done Skaven and Undead, but, uh, you know, we've got the Ballistic Skill, Agility, Leadership, Alertness, Accuracy is way down here, but just try to look to see where you want to send your warp stone early on to be able to save because by having all these guys dodgers for the henchmen definitely getting that agility uh discount by 10 percent saved huge amounts of money so kind of rushing that and then the strength to be able to get everybody's armor um the intelligence was rarely used until the uh spellcasters started getting in there and then obviously the weapon skill would have been good but there's just it costs so much i mean you're talking two thousand to get higher than this so what I would do is like do this max it out max this one out or level it up I should say then when I came time to sending the shipment to Vlad he'd have a 10% um, bonus and then I could max him to a level and then that would reset it and that's how I could maximize the amount of money I was getting here because I was definitely flush with cash for a lot of time until I had to finally start getting my abilities because in this uh, playthrough I was definitely a little bit late to start maximizing levels because I wanted to get that cryptor going as much um, so I definitely could have completed this campaign quite a bit quicker had I been more on the ball so hopefully that will help you and like help you uh, get to um, some better choices to allow for a more expedited uh, campaign than what I had so thanks for watching I hope you're enjoying these videos if you are please give my channel a like and subscribe to get me to post more content for you have a great day